Hey, what's going on, everyone? I hope this video finds you well. Today, we are back with Steven Silber talking about phase transitions. In this video, we will heavily rely on understanding why solving for the free energy is so powerful in statistical mechanics. So if this doesn't sound familiar to you, I highly recommend watching my video, When is a Problem in Statistical Mechanics Solved? I'll put a link in the description uh, for that particular video. Uh, but with this in mind, welcome, Steve. Take it away. Hello, everyone. Today, I will be presenting the second video in this video series about phase transitions. In this one, I'll be moving on from my explanation about phase transitions in general to introduce you to mean field theory from the perspective of later developing Landau theory. Uh, I'm going to do this in two parts, and the discussion will assume some knowledge of uh, thermodynamics. So in the last video, I introduced the idea of phase transitions, and in particular, those which occur as a result in the change of the thermodynamic parameters, pressure and temperature. We've seen that we can make a phase diagram which describes the regions in this pressure temperature space where a substance is in different phases. And these regions are separated by curves, which we can simply call phase separation curves. The important thing to keep in mind about phase separation curves in this discussion is that phase separation curves are not all the same. They can describe a change from one phase to the other, which is either a second order phase transition or a first order phase transition. As a reminder from the first video, uh, we described first order phase transitions as always characterized by a change in the latent heat and a continuous phase transition will never be associated with a release or absorption of latent heat. Moreover, we can also have phase separation lines intersecting, and we will explore this further in our development of Landau theory. So with all the different ways we can have phase transitions, the problem of describing them, or even a class of them, seems somewhat unwieldy. This is where Landau theory comes in, though. It introduces an extremely powerful framework to describe the class of phase transitions called continuous or second order. We will be directly covering Landau's paper from 1937, where he lays the groundwork for his theory. So we will only be talking about continuous phase transitions. It is worth remarking though, that Landau theory can also be extended to first order phase transitions, though we won't cover that in this video. So fundamentally, we can separate phase transitions into two groups, as we have first and second order phase transitions, those which release latent heat and those which don't. When there is latent heat released, we say that phase transition is first order. Otherwise, it is second order. This might be different from how you've heard first and second order phase transitions categorized. That is, you might have heard that the categor categorization calls phase transitions exhibiting discontinuities in the first derivative of the free energy as first order, and those which exhibit discontinuities in the second derivative as second order. So this is simply another classification scheme, but the one based on latent heat is the one that we use and is used in general. So the second thing I would like to describe for our discussion is symmetry, the idea of symmetry. This is a subject in physics, which can alone be developed into its own lecture series because of its usefulness and prevalence and how it's used everywhere, really. But here we will talk of it only simply, just to the point of motivating some of Landau's arguments. Formally, symmetry means that something is invariant under some transformation. As an example, suppose we have a collection of identical marbles sitting in a perfectly square arrangement. Then we would observe that our collection has reflective symmetry, both in the horizontal and vertical axis. We can also describe that there is translational symmetry. This is really a simple example, but in fact, there are hundreds of types of symmetry. Many physical systems, which seem totally unrelated, can actually be brought together under the same framework using symmetry considerations. In fact, this is the essence and beauty of Landau theory. So to quickly recap, Landau theory is the framework for describing continuous phase transitions. And this is all based on symmetry considerations. So now moving on to what Landau theory does and how it does this. And this is started with the very important fact and forms the foundation of Landau theory. Continuous phase transitions are never connected with a change in symmetry. 
So I use the word connected here deliberately. A phase transition can still be continuous, even if the body has a change in symmetry, such as a change in the lattice symmetry. But this is because even though the symmetry changes, we can dis still describe this change with a continuous variable. And correspondingly, we can call the phase transition continuous and begin to formulate a theory for it. Before I go into further detail about Landau theory, some principles and implications can be understood by visiting the Ising model first. Introduced by Ernst Ising in the 1920s, the Ising model describes ferromagnetism in a lattice of magnetic spins. The ability to display rich dynamics and complex behavior has made the Ising model the subject of extensive research, serving as a useful tool for understanding phase transitions in general. I will show how a quantity called the order parameter can be derived and assigned based on the magnetization and illustrate how a mean field approximation is applied to this end and finally arrive at a free energy description of this model. The Ising model describes a lattice of n magnetic particles with classical spins S subscript i is equal to plus or minus one. They can either be up or down, subject to an external magnetic field that induces a magnetization B. We will let the system be isotropic. And this means that the interaction between all sites is the same. So we have the interaction energy epsilon uniform between all sites. The energy of the system in the particular configuration is given by the following equation. And this is the sum of the interaction energies and the magnetization. The first term accounts for the interaction energies between each site I and all of its neighbors J and nu I. And nu I is the set which describes nearest neighbors, next nearest neighbors, up to some finite range of interaction neighbors. And the second term accounts for the energy from the external magnetic field B. Now we wanna assign some kind of value to represent the state of this system. The natural candidate is a value that measures the magnetization. Since we want to be general over all system sizes, we assign this variable to reflect the average magnetization over all sites. So this is done by summing all of the spins and dividing by the total number of spins. Therefore, a system defined by a mixed spin state with no intrinsic magnetization is represented by a value of this variable, which tends to zero. And completely aligned spins corresponds to a value equal to plus or minus one, depending on the spin state. This applies to a subsystem as well as to individual sites. This choice for the value is quite deliberate in that we have intentionally chosen the values of zero and one at particular states of the system. So now with a description of the state of the system, we will move on to describing the phase transition we begin from the statistical thermodynamics consideration of the problem using the canonical partition function for n particles with two possible states up or down. It is given as follows. Z is the notation for the canonical partition function, and it is the sum over all possible microstates, which we denote by K. With a little bit of reorganization, considering that the spins can only be up or down, we can actually write it as the product over all sites of the sum of the two states. The free energy per spin is then given by the following relationship. Uh, Kb is the Boltzmann constant. So now we can come back to the variable that represents the average magnetization in terms of these quantities that we've just introduced. Using the previous equations and putting them into the equation for the expectation value, we can now obtain an expression for psi in terms of these quantities. So here is the substitution shown, and we can actually perform a simplification, which turns this into an expression for psi as the partial derivative of the free energy with respect to the magnetization B. When the spins do not interact, the model represents paramagnetism, in which case there's the well-known result that psi is the hyperbolic tangent of B divided by KBT. So at this point, let's connect all this discussion and this Ising model back to Landau theory. We know that Landau theory formulates an expression for the free energy of the system at the phase transition. Therefore, we want to explore non-zero interaction energy 
as well as consider the field-free system where B is equal to zero. This is because we want to understand the nature of the system only with respect to the behavior it exhibits from temperature changes and not under the influence of any external field. Introducing a field to this kind of discussion is actually a different topic entirely. We introduce interactions and reduce the complexity of the model by applying mean field theory here, which will simplify the analytics. So at this point, let's revisit the equation, which describes the equation of the state of the system. So that was the equation which expresses the interaction energy and the magnetic energy. An approximation to the interaction energy can be carried out based on two things. We assume that all neighbor interactions are nearest neighbor. And we also assume that those nearest neighbor interactions are the mean value of the system spin state, hence mean field approximation. The following is a replacement made in the system energy and is expressed as follows. Nu is the number of nearest neighbor interactions. So at this point, we want to use this new equation for the system energy in the field-free state and substitute it into the partition function. Evaluating yields z, the partition function, is equal to two times the hyperbolic cosine of the following terms, all to the power of n, where n is the number of sites in the system. When we combine this with the earlier equation for the expectation value of psi, we can obtain a transcendental equation given in the following way. Again, this is at zero applied field. And in this state, the change of psi with respect to t passing through the phase transition is consistent with Onsager's exact solution. So by expanding this equation for psi about the Curie temperature T subscript C, which is the critical temperature for the sizing model, we can get approximate solutions in this region. Recall that the whole point of this exercise is coming to some sort of formulation for the system around the region where the phase transition happens. This region is defined by you know, the change in T. By substituting the equation for psi into the free energy per spin, and then expanding to fourth order, we get an equation for the free energy, which seems somewhat unwieldy. So let's rewrite this equation in a slightly different way, where we want to make it a little bit more tangible, a little bit more coherent. The idea is to first eliminate the TC, the T, perhaps put that in a function, and as well move out the epsilon and new terms. So dividing and combining into functions, we obtain the following final expression purely in terms of psi and t. So what is this formulation now? What have we accomplished at this point? What we're looking at is an example of the Landau free energy. In Landau theory, an expression for the free energy of some bulk phase near a continuous phase transition is formulated as a function of a variable that characterizes the state of the system. In this case, as we've seen, it is psi, which is the average magnetization. So this variable, which we've simply introduced, is actually the crux of the whole Landau theory derivation, and it is known as the order parameter. An order parameter can typically be assigned for any system and is constructed in such a way as to reflect the symmetries and properties of that system. This is a very powerful formulation. We will explore this in more detail and develop a little bit more precisely what the order parameter is. There is also one critically important thing I'd like to mention about this formulation, and that is that all the power terms of the order parameter are even. This is called a symmetric free energy. So what have we achieved at this point? We now have the idea of what an order parameter is. And we have seen an example of the expression of the free energy of a system around its phase transition point in terms of this order parameter. This concludes our discussion for this video, and we will continue it more formally in the next one when we go through Landau's paper directly. Okay, so that was absolutely awesome, Steve. Uh, another great video. Um, for those of you who are still watching, I hope you liked the video. If you did, feel free to like, subscribe, and leave a comment below.